her beloved garden state. I'm in uh, what they call the land of enchantment, which is New Mexico, but I'm from the garden state. And so the sentiment still applies. Um, I understand that the NOFA winter conference is a time for workshops and lessons and to connect with other farmers and gardeners in the community. Obviously, that's not happening in the same way this year, and we're all adapting. So uh, we find ourselves here at the first ever virtual NOFA New Jersey Winter Conference. So on behalf of all of the other earthlings who care about what we put into our body and into our earth, thank you for your efforts, both in the field and in the community. So with no further ado, I would like to welcome you to the NOFA Winter Conference. Thank you. Hello and welcome. My name is Tony Kinnett and I'm going to be the MC and host for the 31st annual NOFA New Jersey Winter Conference. Now, as you can already tell, this year is going to be a little different than normal as we are having a virtual broadcast. But most of you by now are familiar with Zoom and I've got a couple things I'd just like to remind you of. Please make sure your microphone is on mute unless it's your turn to talk. Also, Please make sure your cameras are off as we don't want any accidental voyeuristic observations. Whoa, hey, uh, that's today. Um, all right, uh, let me just brush my hair. I'll be right over, it's Nova day. Okay, uh, how do I turn this thing off? Uh, <laughs> Scott. Oh, well, we've got some very interesting um, people coming in to talk with us, and I'm so excited. Over the next two days, we have speakers uh, on wonderful topics about agriculture and the environment, and oh, <laughs> and here's my wonderful neighbor and friend, Scott Morgan. All right. Hey, everybody. Scott Morgan here. Uh, super excited to be with you guys. Sorry about that before. I forgot to turn my camera off. Um, so yeah, let's let's get into this awesome 31st annual NOFA Winter Conference. So first, we're going to talk about uh, Ironbound Farms. So our first speaker, as you know, is a very important piece of the Ironbound puzzle. Um, now this spring, I got to visit Ironbound as uh, NOFA New Jersey, NOFA Connecticut, and NOFA Mass were working together with the SIG grant, the Conservation Innovation Grant which you can watch the full whole episode on the NOFA New Jersey YouTube channel. But for right now, we're just gonna show you the trailer. All right, so um, next, Charles Rosen has been committed to social and environmental justice throughout his careers in law, film production, and advertising. In 2012, he started Ironbound Farm, a unique social enterprise pursuing the interconnected goals of fostering human, environmental, and economic, oh, of course I can't read that part, repair. Rather than rebuilding a national brand, Charles is testing the idea that a business is better able to accelerate positive and inclusive social and economic change by embedding itself deeply in a web of reciprocal relationships within a local community. Uh, the network of interdependent businesses at Ironbound Farm include Ironbound Hard Cider, a venture committed to the revival of Newark's lost legacy of hard cider production, and New Ark Farms, the agricultural team that provides apples and botanical infusions to the cider company, as well as produce and proteins uh, for the on-farm on tasting rooms and farm market. So through regenerative agricultural practices, New Ark Farms team builds a biologically rich community of plants and soil dwelling life that together foster resiliency and viability in the farm's heritage cider orchard organic produce operation and 
pastured livestock business. Ironbound Farm is located in Asbury, New Jersey and Northern Hunterdon County. So uh, with no further ado, uh, Charles, why don't you take it away? Great, good morning, Tony. Um, hey, Scott. Uh, hi, everyone. It, it, it's such an honor to be starting the conference with you all. Um, I'm really grateful to be spending the weekend with you. There, there's some in, in, incredible speakers um, over the weekend who, who I think have created really important areas of, of practice and study to help keeping organic growing relevant in, and important in New Jersey. Um, and I, I think it's the kind of weekend that will help us all recalibrate and, uh, you know, no pun intended, but feed us the kind of energy we need to come out of this pandemic pointed in the right direction. Um, when conceiving of ecological farming, the, the earliest thinkers like George Washington Carver and the Rodales envisioned a stewardship of the land that embraced a, a full range of environmental, social, and animal welfare benefits. But, but since organic farming became codified, which a move that was you know, intended to protect the integrity of the organic label, we've seen a quiet erosion of those values. The ones that consumers um, expect and assume are guiding the work of certified farms. Um, and this has led to organic production on a massive industrial scale, uses methods such as animal confinement, input substitution, and, and soilless growing that, that violate the philosophical grounding of organics and, and maybe more importantly, as well as the consumer understanding of, of what they're purchasing. Um, and this distance between the grower and the customer has, has allowed for the complete, what I think of as the commoditization of organics. Um, so like the marketplace is now awash um, in industrial organic foods that are marketed with the imagery and messaging of free roaming livestock and diversified farm landscapes managed by happy farm families because those companies know that customer loyalty is won by brands that resonate at a deep symbolic level. The problem is though, th those bucolic images have absolutely nothing to do with the farming practice of those industrial players. Um, so in uh, one of my many weird past lives, uh, I, I co-founded co an ad agency uh, vo focused on building these kind of iconic brands. Um, we had a proprietary practice uh, known as cultural branding and I think it's easy to kind of sum up cultural branding like this. Um, when we think of big, powerful, iconic brands, um, they all hold out a powerful worldview, um, an ideology that res resolves, you know, cultural tensions at a specific moment in time. Um, you know, and a lot of iconic brands did this by creating powerful marketing campaigns that that deeply resonated at those specific moment in times with customers, like brands like Coke, you know, Donald Trump. <laughs> um, uh, you know, and, and, and Budweiser, and I think of Budweiser as kind of an interesting example because um, if you think back to the 70s, uh, early 80s, when, when as, a, as a society, we were shifting from being a production-based uh, economy to a professional services-based economy. Um, and, uh, and at that point, you know, we had this sort of wiping out of white working class uh, Americans, you know, the emasculation of the American worker. And, and at that moment, Budweiser comes out with the This Bud's For You campaign, right? It was a salute to the American worker. It said, hey, you steel worker, you guy that builds bridges, whatever, you know, you built this country and uh, this Bud's for you. So, um, you know, didn't really matter what the liquid tasted like, because um, we all know what Bud tastes like, but uh, but it was about the fact that this brand resonated at a, at a symbolic level of became a badge of honor for those for those working class men. Um, but there's also another kind of company that has created a, a similar kind of iconic status, but not through ad campaigns, but rather they did it through how they chose to do business. And at our agency, we call that cultural innovation. Uh, and, and companies like Starbucks, Patagonia, Organic Valley, um, you know, and uh, and companies like Ben and Jerry's, you know, Ben and Jerry's at least until they were sold by Unilever, um, did built big iconic brands under this idea of choosing to do business a certain way that resolved those cultural tensions that people were feeling at a moment in time. 
um, and, and you know, just using Ben and Jerry's as an example of that, um, I, I know it really well because we opened our ad agency together and, um, you know, not only were their first client, but they were really guiding us on how to become a social enterprise and, you know, a lot of what I've built uh, later at Ironbound uh, comes from my time with Ben and others. But, um, you know, uh, when Ben and Jerry started, uh, you know, one of the first steps that Ben took was, was to uh, help create and empower the St. Albans Creamery Co-op. Um, and, and what he was saying to these growers, to these dairy farmers was, if you take growth hormones out of, you know, your practice, we're going to buy milk from you at, at, at fair rates, um, regardless of the fluctuations of, of, of the market you know, economy, regardless of the, and, and milk as a commodity really does ebb and flow. And, and Ben never, you know, dipped below a certain level that, that made it viable for these farmers to actually take RBGH um, out of their growing practice. And, and I could say, I think I'm fair in saying that, you know, one guy, Ben Cohen, took growth hormones out of milk for our entire nation. Um, you know, at least he led that, that charge. Um, but now that you know Ben and Jerry's is owned by Unilever, they're still making Ben and Jerry's ads. Um, but it's just ads. Like making ice cream that uses a sliver of fair trade chocolate isn't a business practice. It's it's a marketing gimmick, right? And um, and and I feel like this is exactly what so many of these industrial farms are doing with organics, right? Um, so, so this is where our network of, of social enterprise businesses like at Ironbound Farm come in. Um, after spending a chunk of time trying to apply these cultural branding principles in the world of politics, uh, yeah, it's, it's weird. I went from sort of being a, a lawyer turned ad guy turned politician. Uh, I don't know on the ethics ladder, maybe it was next, like, I don't know, used car salesman or something, but anyway, you know, when I tried to apply these kind of principles in, in, in my political work, um, I, I worked on some really big uh, national campaigns, um, even explored a, a run for Congress, but I decided that I was going to have very little impact trying to shift a system that was working so beautifully for the people for whom it worked, right? Uh, so instead of trying to change that dominant political system, uh, rather I set out to build a, a smaller system, one that I saw as committed to the repair work I was so desperately interested in. Um, I wanted to prove that a for-profit business could engage in environmental and human repair and still be financially successful because of the way it did business, not, not in spite of it. So about 10 years ago, I started Newark Farms with the, the goal of trying to help rekindle the Newark economy. Um, and in order to do so, I knew that I needed to do that in partnership with, not for, you know, the residents of Newark itself. And although I had absolutely no idea what we were going to do as a company, I knew we needed to engage the most underserved members of, of Newark, paying living wages and, and create a space where those men and women could, could heal and, and, and take the time to thrive and, and become more engaged members of, of, of the community. You know, my plan, if I had one, uh, was to create a business, any business that was focused on ecological repair, through urban ag and provide living wage jobs to the city's most chronically underemployed. <clears throat> so initially our team was primarily made up of, of formerly incarcerated men and women. A portion of the community was faced just generations of neglect and, and you know, obviously intentional sub, subjugation. So um, I felt that it was critical to, to start working with this most underserved members of, of our community. And, you know, together we explored various areas of urban agriculture. Uh, we built a few community gardens, um, experimented with vertical farming, sorry, uh, um, and, uh, and, and somehow found ourselves starting a fulfillment center where we were making terrariums and decorating tabletop Christmas trees for sale at Brookstone. Not quite sure how that happened, but uh, anyway, uh, we clearly didn't have much handle on, on what we were doing. And one example of that comes to mind. Um, uh, uh, there was a, an older woman working with us named Wanda and we were all sitting around uh, our warehouses in, in the Ironbound district and, and she said, you know, I think we can grow anything in here in Newark. Uh, she said, I think we should be growing cotton. And I said, well, you know, Wanda, I, I know I said there's no bad ideas uh, when it comes to brainstorming, but uh, I, I got to say, I think that's a really, really bad idea. So uh, 
Thankfully, uh, not long after that conversation, we came to learn that hard cider was one of the earliest industries in Newark. Um, and Newark cider was beloved by the likes of George Washington and, and Thomas Jefferson. And, and it was so good that in, in you know, great Jersey fashion, it was relabeled as champagne and sold on the black market as such, right? I just, I just love that Jersey has been Jersey <laughs> since the beginning of time. So, uh, you know, our new plan, or maybe actually our first plan, uh, was to plant a, an orchard of historic 18th century Newark apples on a farm uh, that we found that's about 45 minutes outside of Newark and start a hard cider company to revive this lost piece of the city's history. And, you know, Ironbound Hard Cider was going to be Jersey's own cultural icon. Uh, so, you know, we committed to some key things. We committed to sourcing everything from our regenerative farm or other local farmers. Uh, our workforce expanded uh, beyond just returning citizens to include uh, immigrants, uh, refugees and, and veterans, um, you know, who I think really um, showed us that the kind of chronic poverty in our agrarian communities um, really matched that of, of what, what we were seeing when we were myopically focused on, on, on the city uh, in Newark. Um, so, and then, you know, and we said, we're gonna make, we're gonna craft a cider with only fresh local ingredients, no concentrate, no added sugar, no preservatives, you know? And so with all of that and my background in building some of the most powerful brands in the world, you know, we thought we were just going to kill it, like, right, dominate the marketplace. Well, you know, we didn't realize that companies like Angry Orchard, who's owned by Sam Adams and, and Budweiser, uh, you know, would have a lot of other things to say about that, you know, about our dominating the market. We learned very quickly that, that we were wrong to believe that we could compete in their winner takes all marketplace, where price rules and scale simply just buys you access to all the shelves. Um, our brand wasn't resonating in that world where just like organics, craft had become completely commoditized, right? The diversity of craft beer labels that we all see in the liquor stores hide the fact that many of those beer brands have been purchased by or even started by national and, and multinational firms. Um, and the fact that they're all participating in what I call the, you know, this race to the bottom, right, where, where you know, get as much liquid into the market um, at the lowest price possible to, to win the shelf wars. Um, so everything we thought we were doing of value from how we farm to our employment practices to our sourcing of local ingredients, you know, wasn't resonating as deeply in that wholesale market because that's not what the buyers at the stores and bars were valuing. And you know, just ask any customer how hard it is to find a four pack of Ironbound behind a pallet of you know effing White Claw, right? Um, so, uh, and and we're seeing the same thing in organic agriculture. A lot of small and mid-sized organic farmers are facing the exact same issues we were facing in 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 uh, you know the beer wars. It's, it's, it's hard to resonate against a mega industrial organic farm when they can check all the boxes, even though they're not farming with the ethos of those early thinkers that I was talking about. Um, you know, so it's impossible for a lot of organic farmers, including us, you know, to compete in the price wars against farms with spotty labor practices, no real commitment to soil. You know, many of the large industrial farms now on the West Coast, um, their labor is lent to them by private prisons, right? So it's real hard to compete when we're trying to pay living wages and they have you know, minimally paid or unpaid uh, forced labor. Um, I was told maybe I shouldn't say what I think that's called uh, when you have unpaid forced labor, but I think we all kind of have an idea. Um, so you know, attendees of this conference know that all organic is, is not created equal. Right, uh, that real organic is different than just using the approved inputs. And for us to create and grow a reliable long-term market for our products, we have to collectively build something that our customers really value. And, and, and we have to figure out how our work can be, you know, be fairly compensated in that world of commoditized organics. So I think at Ironbound, uh, you know, an important part of what we're doing uh, isn't on the marketing or the, the cultural branding side, but it's the cultural innovation part, right? How we are choosing to do business and how those choices deeply resonate with our customers and visitors. Not, not just, you know, in, in marketing, right? With, you know, like when I think about it on the marketing front with their use of idyllic orchard and farm scenes 
Angry Orchard, you know, a company that makes all of their hard cider from overseas concentrate, and Driscoll, a company that grows organic strawberries hydroponically, you know, overseas, um, they, they have the marketing and the cultural branding part down just fine, right? But what they don't have is a consistency between the work and the message, which for us is the crucial point of distinction. You know, back to my Budweiser example, it's not like Budweiser uh, addressed the concerns of the American worker. They just did big Super Bowl ads, you know, about them. And, and, and heck, they sold the company with all of its hyper American branding to a multinational conglomerate. I mean, Bud's not even an American company anymore. Um, so, so if that's the market we're all competing in, we're never going to win, right? We simply can't beat them at the commodity wars. But that doesn't mean we all don't have tremendous value to the communities that we serve, right? And, and therefore, I think we're, we really can find a powerful way towards viability. Um, we just need to define our marketplace. And, and it's in that marketplace where things that we all value, like soil and water health, economic viability for our farmers and food producers, uh, social justice, animal welfare, um, all of those things can be valued by our customers as well. Um, you know, if only farm markets weren't just six months a year, two days a week, if it didn't rain, uh, that would be one hell of a, a space in which we could do just that. So, you know, we really all need to decide what, you know, what are we, those of us at this conference, contributing to our community, right? How does that contribution create viability for each of us? Um, if it's just access to a certified carrot, um, I'd say don't bother. Um, you know, because if our relationship with customers is just transactional, we lose because none of us can get an organic carrot to market better or cheaper than I don't know, bunny love, right? Um, so we must create a local food system where we can win on our terms rather than the terms of the global marketplace. And so at Iron Band, we've been thinking a lot about this, right? How do we create a local food system that incorporates the farmer, the maker, the purveyor, um, trying to do our best to cut out a lot of the middlemen in between, um, you know, by building like a horizontally integrated system, not a vertically integrated one under me, right? That, that's not the goal. It's how do we build a community-based model built on reciprocal race relationships um, uh, between, you know, New Jersey growers, value add producers, and, and, and retailers. Um, I'll just try to capture this one example of that uh, quickly if I can. Um, uh, so uh, one of our longest standing employees, our, our crew chief, uh, uh, a, a guy named James, who, who, who comes out of um, you know, the Newark uh, community, um, an ex-offender, uh, his wife, Natasha, an incredible chef, uh, lost her job during COVID um, for having worked at, at, with the Marriott Hotel Organization for over 20 years. Um, and um, you know, obviously they, she was in the catering department and they didn't have much catering going on in the past year. So she unfortunately was laid off. And uh, we, we brought her in uh, to our tasting room and, and cider garden to you know, be cooking with us. But um, in a move that I initially thought was really, really stupid, uh, but also the most romantic gesture I think I've ever seen um, for their anniversary, James bought Natasha a little kind of hole in the wall restaurant in East Orange uh, that she could make her own. Um, so I thought opening a restaurant in the middle of COVID was a, was a bad idea, but um, they said, no, like we have an obligation to serve our community. Our food needs to be in our neighborhoods. And, and so with that in mind, I don't know, I just found it so inspiring. So the three of us sat down and talked and we created a plan where, you know, we're growing organic food uh, that James, I mean, we're not growing it. James, her husband is, is growing the food um, that, that, that Natasha is putting her, you know, Caribbean spin on and, and, and creating this incredible, uh, you know, you know, menu of options that's local organic food, you know, in, in her Caribbean restaurant. But, but not only, it doesn't only go that one direction. Um, we're now having Natasha um, use that same, our, our proteins and our, and our produce that she's putting her, you know, 
personal spin on, we're bringing that back to our cider garden and our farm market, right? So we're selling her stuff as value add products and as, you know, prepared foods um, in our own system. So again, this idea of reciprocal relationships where it's going back and forth and back and forth between the farmer, the value add producer, the restaurateur, um, and, 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 and us as, a, as a, even a marketplace, right, with shells. Um, and, and, and so, you know, that wasn't the impact uh, on, on Newark that I fir first envisioned, but, but it's so much better than what I thought I could be doing because in, instead of it being about me and my vision, uh, which clearly I didn't have one, um, it, it was, it's about Natasha and James expanding the work of, of our farm through their own dream, right? A dream that Ironbound is, is deeply now invested in and, and we're really, you know, gunning for her success. Uh, and, and I think it, you know, it comes down to like, we keep bringing everything back to our tagline that, that we're, you know, that we all focus on, but, it, but our tagline is Jersey takes care of its own, right? And, and what we mean by that is, you know, we have a responsibility to take care of each other, our land, you know, our communities, our food, you know, et cetera. And, and so I think that's, that's a really, you know, big piece of it. And, 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 and not only is it happening, you know, from a product perspective, but, but it really helps us tell our story when people come to the farm, right. As a, you know, destination, whether it's to hang out in the, the cider garden or shop at our markets, you know, people are eating and drinking products born out of this network. Um, and by coming to the for farm, you know, these folks actually feel, it's not just that they see it or hear us tell about it, they feel what comes out of a fully integrated ecosystem. They see how our flowers and our eggs and our herbs and our livestock all bring value to our farm beyond just the transactional crop price at sale. And, and why our farming practices deliberately blur the boundary between cultivated and wild, right? Um, so we, we explain that it isn't just about having diversity in our fields, um, but rather how that diversity is truly integrated. We think of this, actually, we didn't think of this, uh, Johan at Fields Without Fences uh, taught me that what I was talking about was integrated functionality. And integrated functionality works whether we're talking about building a healthy ecosystem in the soil, or we're talking about building community, you know, that that captures diversity and and and, and systems integration. Um, and 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 even you know, in our own practices, we're continually trying stuff. Um, most of the time, not succeeding, but but trying stuff and developing new models of partnership where where we can help build you know this community of growers and help grow again horizontally as a community-based business. Um, one very, very current example um, of that is that I, I'd mentioned that, you know, we have flowers as part of our offering. I mean, we have acres and acres of pollinator strips um, as, as part of our integrated orcharding system. Um, we've been, we're, we're now in talks with a, a young grower, an amazing rock star of a flower grower who also happens to be um, a floral designer. And um, so we literally couldn't afford her um, as just a farmer. Um, but so what we did was we worked out a, 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 a partnership where, where we're building a company together where, you know, we at Ironbound are, are, are providing all of our infrastructure that includes, you know, support staff and greenhouses and, and everything that we bring. Um, and she is, um, you know, putting in the sweat equity, so to speak, right? She, she's going to be the lead flower grower. Um, but what we've decided is we're just going to sell her those flowers at 50% of wholesale, right? So we've cut her costs for her floral design business in half, right? So now her as the value add producer can actually get more money because her input costs are so low, but she's, you know, she's investing her time as a farmer. She's designing these incredible arrangements and bouquets. Um, and, and she can make that much more money on the back end because her costs are, are, are so low, you know, and obviously Ironbound benefits tremendously. We, we have the beautification of our farm. We're increasing our pollinator strips, um, you know, and we're selling those arrangements, uh, you know, at, in our market and, and heck Ironbound, you know, as, as a tasting room, we're, we're, we're one of her big customers because, you know, if and when we get back to dinners and stuff, uh, you know, we need arrangements there. So it's, 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 it's building a whole thing and, and it becomes a, a massive marketing opportunity for her because, um, you know, the thousands of people that come through our doors see those flowers and they're like, oh, we're having a wedding, you know, where'd you get your flowers? And so the whole thing is building on one another. So I think in, 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 
in in closing, I, I, I try to wrap this all up. Um, I, I think, you know, we have to realize when we're fighting the commodity wars and people are buying for reasons like price and convenience, you're never going to build brand loyalty. You know, discounting product may increase sales momentarily, but you're not developing real true brand value. But when people buy for ideological reasons, when people are connected to you because you're resonating at a deeply symbolic level, right, because you're resolving these cultural tensions at a moment in time, they're never going to leave you for a lower price. And, and you know, we all know that that connection literally makes your product taste better, right? So we're not going to win the commodity wars, but like, who cares? Um, here's what I think we can do as New Jersey farmers right now. We can build community, we can serve that community, and we can reframe our work as stewards of the land and of human health. And we can be connected to that original ethos of organic farming because it does respond to every single one of the cultural tensions that we're all stressing over these days, right? We can address climate change and income inequality and, and racial injustice, you know, even the, the toxic versus left versus right, you know, discourse we're all in. I mean, some of my favorite moments at their farm is when I see a guy in a Make America Great Again hat working side by side with a black gang member from Newark, right? As 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 family, um, it it works. Um, and so I think if we do all of that, we can compete well in the marketplace. But it's our marketplace, right? And and I think that's how we're going to build an agricultural movement together. And, and and trust me, people are yearning for that kind of local food system these days more than ever. So, you know, scale in and of itself isn't bad, but scale that compromises principles is devastating. So instead of continuing to sit by silently while industrial organic co-ops the imagery and language of small scale farming, we need to re reframe them as a commodity and, and, and define it in a ways that our farming methods and products are superior. You know, th this New York metropolitan region in which we all live, you know, yeah, it's the playground for those mega, mega dominant players, but it also happens to be the playground for the truly innovative creative craft players. You know, and as New Jersey farmers, we have the rare opportunity to, you know, choose which playground or the other are we gonna be in. So if any of us think we're gonna be, you know, competing against the mega players in their marketplace, but kind of sort of doing what they do, but just more expensively, we can't. And that's really the hard lesson that I had to learn. It took me a while to learn it. Um, you know, we thought that success would come from having our products in as many stores and bars as possible, but that doesn't create success if we're buried on the bottom of a shelf behind a, you know, a pole and and and, and no one knows our story. So, as you go through this conference this weekend. Um, keep an ear out for creative ideas and potential partners. Um, throughout this conference, you're gonna hear other stories that highlight the value of healing that organic farming brings to our state. I encourage you to use those stories to inspire your work and, and guide your marketing efforts to remind your customers about the environmental and human repair that can be addressed through community-centric, real organic farming. So thank you very much. I, I look forward to your questions. All right, that was wonderful. Um, so we, okay, we had spoke once before and we had talked about how important it is that the story of where the food's coming from gets gets told because that that makes it more real and it, it, it gives the the community a, a connecting point to feel like they're they're not just buying something that's good for their family, they're, they're buying something that's giving back to the, the earth and to the community. And inadvertently, it, it connects all of us. You know, they, yeah. they say the, uh, you know, grassroots, well, as a mushroom grower, I love to also add in that in with those grassroots are those mycological connections. And the more that we connect, uh, you know, the stronger we all are. And, you know, I, yeah. I think that's wonderful. And I think, you know, I mean, gosh, we tell Scott's story all the time, right? I mean, as part of that community, with it, this is the kind of community that we're building. And, and you noted it exactly right. And, and, and mushroom growers know it best of all. The, the, what's happening in creating this diverse ecosystem in the soil, right? It's about how do you create a system of organisms that the more diverse those organisms are, the stronger each organism in that system becomes, right? So as each organism gets stronger, the whole system gets stronger. Well, 
that's what community building looks like, right? If each one of us as individuals can get stronger, um, but not at the expense of the other guy. My success has to come because I'm connected to you, not because I'm moving you out of my way, right? And I will tell you, and you know, in, in, in all of my political work, I came to understand, I think sadly, the, the American dream is very much rooted in the individual, right? It says, if I work hard and you get the hell out of my way, you know, I'm getting a boat and it's your fault that I don't have one. Well, that's not what success looks like, especially for us, those of us are, that are in the community. I'm even looking at all the people that are that I can see the names of that are in this conference already. These are people that we've been building community with together. I'm, I'm not in competition with anybody in this conference. We're all figuring out how to do this shit together. And, and, and so I think you're right, telling, not only telling that story, but letting that story guide how we're thinking about growing stuff and, 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 and supporting one another is, is critical especially in these days when we all now see the negative impact of a dominant national or global food system, right? We saw that during the pandemic. So why are people continuing to value, you know, low cost uh, food that has, that's not nutrient dense um, just because they can get, a, I don't know, a, a mango in November. It's just, it's just not what people should be valuing any longer. And we have to keep in mind those big guys have a huge marketing tool um, in the form of certifications and, oh. and, and stamps and things. But we on the community level have the power of conversations and those conversations are so much stronger. And, and they do that, that weaving, that knitting work um, that, that helps bring us all together and, and really helps, you know, bring out the value of the, of the products that we grow. Yeah, and I, I think that, that's such a critical point because, you know, I struggle with this a lot. Again, as a guy that comes out of the branding universe, I know the value of that kind of certification, right? But again, if Driscoll can be growing, you know, strawberries hydroponically in China and, and it's USDA certified organic, you know, with strawberries the size of my head, you know, no customer is going to know that when they walk in the store and they see like, wow, those are beautiful strawberries and they're a fraction of the price of that guy down the road. Well, we're... we're but that guy down the road, when he can tell his story about his strawberries and they're juicy and they're limited and they don't ship very well because they're so fresh, like that's a strawberry, right? And uh, and 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 so you're right. Um, I, I think we that th those massive marketing dollars, whether it's used in certification or again, I, you know, think about Angry Orchard a lot owned by Sam Adams, but they they have a a, a tiny little orchard in 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 Walden, New Jersey, um, that they put a something like a $26 million ad campaign behind, right? So everybody that's drinking Angry Orchard thinks that it's coming from that tiny little, you know, orchard. Well, those aren't even cider apples, right? So unless Jim Cook, the owner of Boston Brewing, is like cider Jesus and he can make that much cider out of six apples, it ain't happening, right? So the fact that it's overseas concentrate, but with the imagery of, you know, wholesome small scale farmers with some old guy walking through and eating an apple, um, we, we, we can't out market those guys. We can't out, you know, plaster the system, uh, uh, you know, um, so, so you're right. We have to build those, that dialogue. And the only way we can build that dialogue is also creating, I, I think what's really important that I've come to realize is instead of fighting for shelf space, if we can create uh, from the grower to the value add producer to the retailer, if we can create our own system of shelves, right? Our own spaces, right? So, you know, um, if I'm using grains from uh, the River Valley community grain guys to make our flatbreads at the farm and we're selling those grains alongside of our produce uh, in our market, I get to tell that story and now they have both a retail opportunity, but also we're helping them, you know, finance their mill so they can go from just being grain growers to actual flower producers. So now they're the growers, the, val the, the flower producers, and they have a shelf to sell that on. They ain't going to get that into Whole Foods anytime soon. So you're right. We have to not only create the conversation, but create the spaces in which those conversations can happen. So uh, Charles, we've got a question came in. Uh, so how long have you been in on this journey with Ironbound? <laughs> And what's the name of that Caribbean restaurant? Because we're all ah, there. Those are very both good questions. Probably the second one, way more important. Uh, <laughs> God, it's so good. Uh, um, uh, so it's called uh, Tasha's Caribbean Grill, and it's in East Orange. And um, <laughs> it's even funny. I, I'm like, 
like the other night I had the oxtail and it was so fucking good. And, 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 and like, but like Natasha was like, well, I can't get oxtail anywhere. So I've been talking to all my like livestock farmer friends and they're like, we just throw those away. I'm like, don't throw them away anymore. I need as many. So I'm now collecting up oxtail, you know, everywhere that I can in the state um, from all the butchers. So, so she can continue to make that. Um, so, uh, and, uh, to answer the question on on how long, uh, I think a long time. If you ask my wife, it's been a very long time. But um, I started New Arc Farms in in the city uh, a little over ten years ago. We bought the farm itself uh, in in 2014. Planted uh, 10,000 trees in um, in uh, the spring of 2015. And um, I will try to tell this story shortly, but uh, we had one of our great advisors, uh, an orchardist um, with us at the top of our hill, just as the snow was melting in, in, in early spring 2015. And he said, you know, Charles, when you plant your orchards here, um, you're gonna have a hell of an orchard. It's gonna be amazing. And when you plant in a couple of years, we're great. And I said, no, 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 Steve, we're, we're, we're planting in six weeks. He said, you can't do it. You haven't healed the soil. You haven't, you know, worked the land. Um, you, you can't. And I said, well, I got to, I need these apples in the ground. You know, I need these trees in the ground. You know, we had 10,000 trees in our nurseries. Like I got to get these trees in the ground. These guys need work. I'm getting the trees in. He said, man, I love what you're doing. I love this whole project. Like I'm in, you know, I'm in, but so I'm going to say this was as much love and care as I can. You need to stop approaching this like the aggressive New York Jew you are and slow the fuck down. And I said, no, no, no. He goes, no, man, you can't make your trees grow any faster. So of course I don't listen. We plant 10,000 trees. For three years, those trees were struggling. They were anemic. They, we never dealt with invasive species like mugwort and thistle and, you know, Russian olive and, 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 and then, you know, we got to this point three years later where we had to make a bold decision. Like, do we, you know, move to conventional herbicides and pesticides and just blast everything, blow everything up or rip the trees out and start again? It was a devastatingly hard decision to make, but I am so proud that we decided on the latter because what we had learned through those three years was, you know, what did we really need to do to build an integrated system? So we spent two more years cover cropping, just cover cropping, building soil, right? Growing dirt, um, built a system of berms and swales to deal with soil erosion and runoff, um, build these pollinator strips that I was talking about. So now not only do we have bees visiting us, we have hummingbirds and butterflies, right? So we built this rich environment and then we just replanted those trees, you know, this past spring. Um, so we're starting again. It was an epic failure, but I know that what we did was looking at it the long view 20 years out, we're gonna have a much more resilient farm to be able to weather, you know, these coming storms. Yeah. Uh, we've got another question that came in, if you've got a second still. Yeah. Um, do you think the new labeling such as regenerative organic could play a role in these more localized systems? Uh, yes. Uh, I think the short answer is yes, but God, it can get, you know, dismantled pretty quickly. We, we've been uh, working alongside like Rodale, you know, it's interesting. So when, you know, J.I. Rodell or whatever, you know, got certified organics in 1941 or whatever. Again, it, it had these principles intact, right? Um, it had this idea of, of animal welfare and soil health and even social justice were all part of it. And those are all gone. Um, so I think their efforts in trying to create a new certification in regenerative organics that captures all of those things matter. And when they're talking to us about being one of their showcase farms on this, I was like, well, we're only going to participate if if you're taking into account what we're doing, like the workforce piece, right? Like if we're not thinking about the farmer's well-being, I mean, we all know the average farmer in our country makes 14 cents on every food dollar. The second leading cause of death for farmers after tractor accidents in our country is suicide. They cannot keep farming for the banks, right? So I'm looking at that part as part of what a regenerative system is about. I mean, just the word regenerative, though, kind of makes me throw up a little in my mouth. It's a little you know, arrogant, I don't know. I'm struggling with the words, but I think the notion of building a new certification that values everything we're talking about does matter. Cool. Uh, so uh, I guess, uh, does anyone else have any other questions they wanna ask before we do a, a little five minute recess or Charles, do you have anything else you wanna close with? Uh, I, I'm, I'm good on my end, uh, just so everybody knows. I mean, I, I, I think just, the only thing I'll say again is I'm truly inviting everyone to be part of this whole conversation to figure out how not to do your work in a siloed fashion. I mean, 
A lot of folks in New Jersey are doing incredible things, but they're also doing them often on their own, right? We're all pretty fragmented. We're all pretty splintered. So my, my ask to everyone is, is, is think about this as the collective. And especially, like I said, there's some just dynamic folks speaking this weekend. And, and I, I think we can all pull a little from them to, uh, you know, to figure out how, how, how we do this thing together. So that's it. Uh, so we've got we've got a good one, and you're allowed to close with the line. How do you like them apples? Right? Ah, I won't um, do it. I won't do it, Tony. So, uh, okay. Of course, I'm going to do it. Oh, good. Pam Pam Lewis has asked, uh, "What type of apples are you growing? Heirloom varieties?" Yes, good question, Pam. Uh, so, um, uh, you know, the, this this notion of of heirloom of, of Newark cider that was made in the 17 and, and early 1800s uh, was made with uh, a couple of varieties that were thought to be extinct. And we spent a long time with an apple detective, this guy named John Bunker, finding really the, the granddaddy of all of them, which is the Harrison apple. And um, the Harrison uh, has levels of tannins and acids and sugars that just blow your mind, right? After years of finding it and growing these trees, we're like, oh, thank goodness, it actually has, you know, it tastes better. But so when you're making, when you're growing apples, for cider, uh, you know, cider is like wine. You need acids and tannins and sugars and sweet table apples aren't that. So 90% of our apples are American heirloom varieties. Um, we have some French and English just to try some things. Um, but also what I'm really excited about um, more than what we're growing at our farm is we have given away tens of thousands of these heirloom varietals to growers throughout New York, New Jersey, and Pennsylvania. Um, some larger scale organic, uh, not organic actually, but larger scale fruit growers that are growing for the big mega companies like Mott's and Very Fine, right? So what we've done is worked out a relationship with them where they're growing these apples for us so we can diversify our environmental risk, uh, you know, get them throughout the areas and we're paying them a premium, often five times what the juice apples are worth to those companies. So we're trying to create a viable revenue stream to those guys, diversify our environmental risk by having the trees all around and get these heirloom varietals that were almost extinct back into cultivation at a, at a mass level. Um, so cider doesn't end up tasting just like uh, boozy apple juice, which isn't bad, you know, uh, if you're 14 on and drink White Claw. So yeah, um, how do you like them apples, Pam? <laughs> all right, nicely done. All right, well, so there were a few more questions yeah, that, that I'm, came I'm, in. Uh, I think we probably got an, another uh, round for one. This is a deep one, Scott. You want to ask this one? All right. So Kathleen asks, why do we always feel the need to come up with a label, a new fancy name, uh, excuse me, a fancy new name that no one understands to define what we are doing on our farms and in our gardens? Yeah, I mean, that, you know, I think that's the right question. That's why I struggled with the answer to what do I feel about regenerative organic certification? I, I mean, I think... I think you're right. We're always we did this with leads and, and and just every fair trade. Um, again, you know, I worked on building the fair trade line for Ben and Jerry's. I mean, uh, you know, having one line of a little fair trade chocolate and a little fair trade coffee and and vanilla, and we did a mega campaign around it is bullshit, right? Um, that's not doesn't mean that Unilever's now a fair trade company and isn't getting the vast majority of its sugar and chocolate from the Ivory Coast. Um, so. I agree with you that that all of these labels, we keep chasing a label and then it gets stripped away from us. So I, I'm not dependent on the label. I, I, I see that though labeling could maybe help guide some growers into a direction that could be more holistic. Um, but if we're doing that kind of work right, I fought the idea of certification for years at our farm. I was very intentionally not certified for a very long time, right? For exactly the reason you asked. I do not believe that that's guiding my principles. I think I am so past, you know, organics, it's not even funny, but, you know, being part of the marketplace and, and working with schools. And there were some other reasons that we, we decided to do it. But, but I agree with you, hanging our hats on, on some label that's just meaning's gonna shift. And, and I, I would say this, come back to this idea when I was saying in cultural branding, it's about holding out a powerful ideology that responds to tensions, crises at a moment in time. So the ideology never changes right? But the tensions are shifting at a moment in time, right? So this idea of farming the right way, uh, whatever we call it, will end up having value. If we tell our story, the way that Tony and, and, and Scott were saying, if we tell our stories properly, you don't need that label. We just need to have a forum in which we can tell that story. And if the forum's only the shelf, 
at, at some grocery store, you need a certification because otherwise you can't compete with those guys. So if we can create new shelves, if we can create a marketplace where, where farmers, I mean, there was a great article that came out earlier this year by, by Chris Smith. I don't know if everybody knows him and turned into a big brouhaha in our community, but you know, Chris did all of the research to show that, you know, if you look at the cost to going a farm market for every single individual farmer, if you just simply aggregate those costs, we could have a market that's open seven days a week, 365 days a year in closed space, just for the same cost of going to an open air market one or two days a week for six months. So there's ways for us to economically create new marketplaces where we can actually tell our stories the way Scott was saying, without certifications, without fake labels, without anything else. All right, we've got, we've got one last one and then I think we're gonna head to our break. Um, and this one gets down to the nitty gritty of the farming a little bit. Um, Aiden asks, have you found any quantitative benefit to the pollination uh, on your farm due to the pollinator strips? And if so, what varieties work best in these strips? Yeah, you know, um, gosh, the quantification part is a, a, a tricky part of the question because every once in a while we dip our toes into like, oh, we need to do more metrics and we need, you know, support from Rutgers and other places to, to actually prove uh, this stuff out, right? Like how many more bees or butterflies are visiting our farm if we're doing X, Y, Z? Because otherwise we can't really be a proof of concept to somebody. We can't just say like, oh yeah, throw millions of dollars in a you know, pollinator strips and let the, you know, let it rain from the skies. Um, so, so the, the quantification part, we have not really nailed down yet. We're doing a lot of that research. We're doing a lot of like the number counting right now. Um, but I will say qualitatively without question, we have seen a massive increase of, of visitors, um, massive. And as I, I, I alluded to, I mean, it's not just bees, it's, it's butterflies and hummingbirds, right? And seeing the ecosystem just take form for a long, long time, we had a very dead farm and now it is full of vibrant life. To answer your question on which pollinators, I mean, what we're doing in our riparian zones, uh, like our wetland zones are, are very, very different than what we're putting, you know, on the slopes with the other things, but, um, we're doing everything, you know, a range of, of wildflowers and, and perennials that, that you know, um, in different pockets on the farm. And you're welcome to come and see them all in detail if, if, you, if, you, if you want yeah, to. I've, I've, I've seen them. Uh, not only are they functional, they're also gorgeous. The swales controlling the water flow. Um, and this goes for all of you out there. Once, you know, quarantine factor shifts, I strongly implore you to go check out Ironbound. Um, I, I, as a teacher, know that experience, hands-on experience is a really important way to learn. And the experience you get just by going and hanging out at uh, Ironbound, it is fantastic. So please make time to get there and go visit Charles's crew. Um, Yay. Yes. Uh, but so we are, we're going to, we're going to wrap up, take a little five minute break. So if you need to go stretch, reload on coffee, um, if you were lucky enough to get the farmer's breakfast box. So good. Oh, man. I put on the uh, strawberry rhubarb jam on top of the biscuits from Jam and Crepes. Crepes. You say crepes. I say crepes. Um, delicious nonetheless. Anyway, all right. Uh, go take five. We'll see you in a little bit. Thanks, Charles. Thank you, Charles. Thank you, Charles. Hey, Nate Kleinman, I wanted to say hi, I see you there. I've been muted, so I'm gonna get off, but good to see you. Hey, Charles, good to see you. You look sexy in Zoom, man. <laughs> Thanks, you do. You, you may be Charles, winning COVID. are you muted? Charles, I don't I don't know that you are muted. Oh, no, now I'm not, I'm unmuted. I unmuted myself to say hi to Nate, but now I'm going, <laughs> now I'm going mute, I promise. <laughs> Bye, guys. Bye.